you have inputs from all different areas. And they activate some networks of cells. When those cell activity, when that cell activity reaches a certain point, it becomes large enough, it somehow appears in your consciousness. And you become aware of it. So I became aware of a taste, for example, or of seeing you. But at the same time, simultaneously, there are other things happening, and there are other networks of cells that are becoming more active. And when they become more active, they overcome the other one, and that comes into your consciousness, and the other one becomes unconscious. But actually, she concludes very nicely at the end of her paper, and you've seen I've written it here, just how the water has turned into wine, how the bump and grind of the neurons and the shrinking and expanding of assemblies actually translate into subjective experience is, of course, another story completely. So we, we don't know how these brain cells you know, contracting and becoming active lead to, to your thoughts. And one of the problems with uh, these sort of so-called conventional theories are, are the following. First of all, we can't, as I said, explain how consciousness arises, how the thought arises. Secondly, if you think about it, at any one time, there are millions and millions of processes going on. And how do those suddenly all lead to this sense of self, the oneness? No one really understands that. And you can't explain it through the activity of millions of brain cells or billions of brain cells. And how does something that you're not conscious of then also suddenly become into your awareness and into your consciousness? And I think the most important thing is how do we account for free will? Because if we were all constructed from the activity of these brain cells, as, as has been uh, proposed, then there should be no room for any accountability in our society. Right? My brains did it, my brain cells did it, had nothing to do, if I throw a brick at my neighbor's window, I should not be accountable because it was all done by those brain cells, it was nothing to do with me. Thankfully, that doesn't exist, otherwise there'll be chaos in society and there is um, a legal system and there is a judiciary and if you do something, you are held accountable. But, Think about it. You can't, if you really believe in that, it's difficult to explain how we have free will. And I know some people are interested in, in the work that, that we're doing uh, with Peter and a number of other colleagues in trying to understand about consciousness. So I'm just going to talk for about five minutes about that and then hand over to Peter. So one of the things that I became interested in many years ago was this whole idea of consciousness. Why am I the way I am? And what happens when people, when my patients essentially reach the end of their lives? And I witnessed the cardiac arrest when I was a medical student and of a patient who I got to know very, very well, a very nice man. And his heart stopped for various reasons. And there was a huge team trying to revive him, and they didn't succeed. And I watched as they tried and tried, and I watched the whole process. He went to a flatline state, and they tried and tried, and they couldn't get him back. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what happened to this thinking, conscious being who was here talking to me half an hour ago? Is anything there? Is he able to hear us? Is he able to see us? I'd heard about these so-called near-death experiences, and um, I tried to find out more, and I got very disappointed when I realized there was very little research that had been done in this area. Somebody pointed me in the direction of Peter Fennick, and thankfully, I eventually managed to see him through a very resistant secretary. And uh, we started working on this together, but that was really how my interest developed in this field. And through that time, now I work as an intensive care doctor, so I deal with life and death all the time. Um, and I realized that we just need, we don't have a science of what happens when we die, and um, we need to develop that. So we've tried to work on this for the last 12 or so years, and I'm just going to explain a bit about this to you. So unfortunately, we don't project very well, but where you have between heart attack, traffic accident, and causes of death, there's a triangle, there's a pyramid. So most people think that death is a moment. Most people think that you're either alive or you're dead. You can't be both, right? That sounds very philosophical. You can't be, right? Well, you can. I'll explain why. In the old days, when people died, essentially it was when your heart stopped. So a cardiac arrest, when your heart stops, you stop breathing, and as a consequence of a lack of blood flow, there's no heart beating, your brain shuts down within a few seconds. So that's why we shine a light on, on pupils, on the eyes, and you see they're fixed and dilated. And those are the three criteria to diagnose someone as being dead. There's no heartbeat, they're not breathing, and their brain isn't functioning. They have fixed, dilated pupils. The reflexes have gone. Now, of course, if you died, you know, 150 years ago, there was little we could do about it. And so, by definition, there was a moment of death. The moment of death was when your heart stopped beating. However, in the last 50 years, we have a science of resuscitation. And we're learning more and more about how to restart the heart. So we have people who die, and if we get to them early enough, we can bring them back to life again. And by early enough, this could go over an hour. For example, we have somebody uh, at the intensive care unit in, in Cornell, where I work currently, who uh, was essentially in a cardiac arrest, was dead for almost 45 minutes, miraculously got resuscitated back, 
and had a near-death experience, and I had an incredible experience. So the thing to realize here is that death is a biological process. It starts when your heart stops beating. That's how we define it. But if you can get blood flowing back in the brain again and the rest of your organs, you can get the person back to life. So essentially, in the early phase, death is reversible. And as science progresses, the length of time in which death is reversible will increase. So for example, there are people currently working on drugs that you can potentially inject into people when they have died, when they've had a cardiac arrest, that will slow down the process of brain cell damage. So instead of your cells dying in, say, an hour or half an hour, you may delay that to five hours, 10 hours, 24 hours. So you're actually stopping and slowing that whole process down. And so that's the whole science of resuscitation. And what we are interested in, you can see here, is there is a period where there's so much damage that takes place to the cells in the body as a, lack of, as a consequence of lack of oxygen, that no matter what we do, we can't bring that person at least to a conscious state that we can see what, what's going on with them. Um, but then the reversible say that that's what we're... So we're interested in studying, I'm sorry, the reversible period, which could last up to an hour, maybe more. And what we're interested in finding out, what do people experience? What happens to their mind and consciousness at that time? And I'll tell you why that's interesting. <coughs> But the first thing to point out also is that a lot of people, and I was certainly one of them, would say, well, obviously when you die, you're dead. There's nothing there, right? It, it can't be. But if you bear in mind, if you try to get into the body and think of what's happening, you may challenge that view a little bit. As soon as your heart stops beating, your brain, stops, your brain stops functioning as an organ. But those cells are still potentially viable, as I discussed. They're not so damaged that we can't bring them back to life again. So... At what point after the brain has shut down and there's no oxygen flowing, do we lose our mind and consciousness? When do we stop being aware of who we are? Is it immediately as the heart stops? Is it a few seconds, tens of minutes, an hour later? We simply don't know. But it wouldn't be so illogical to think that if your heart were to stop now and I were to restart it two or three seconds later, but your mind and consciousness should still be there because, you know, it's only been a short time. And that's certainly what we find. Every day in hospitals, people have their hearts stopped for various procedures, 20, 30 seconds, and then they're shocked back to life again. And they don't disappear, they're still there as a person. And what we found is that in the real time, in cardiac arrest, 10 to 20% of people have some kind of thought processes, some kind of memories from that period. But we know that eventually the cells are so damaged that we can't see them. So the question is, what really happens to your mind and consciousness? How long does it hang around for, how long does it last for, is it annihilated immediately, and that's what we don't understand. I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail here, but just to point out, uh, 